It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and, and the uh, photo on my lead slide here shows one of the pleasures, and, and it's not always that a, uh, that a student gets to be on the same program as his, uh, one of his professors in his PhD. And uh, I might have been Dean's only grad student that was older than he is, or maybe you're older than me by two months or three months or something. Yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, so for less than a month. But anyhow, um, uh, in particular, I point out in this picture, this was at a short course at uh, UC Davis, and you can see that Dean's quite enjoying what's going on, and I'm struggling pretty bad, as you can see there. Um, the other thing that was pointed out to me this morning, which uh, I was in a session with graduate students, and one of the graduate students, Kyle, pointed out a 1984 paper, and he said, and I wasn't even born when this paper came out. And then I realized that none of the other people I was on the program with were, had been born when I was doing my PhD. So uh, kind of kind of put things into a little bit of perspective. But today I'm gonna to talk about fat and, uh, and try to talk about it as an energy source and some of its other roles and how we can understand and use it more effectively. I think my comments in some respects are gonna be a little repetitive of what Dina said and Jerry has said, and I'll skip over those. Um, but I want to talk about uh, what's the, really the complete role of fat in the diet. Um, how do sources of fat differ? We've talked about that a fair bit already. How does the utilization of fat differ with age of the pig? Uh, and what can we do to improve our understanding of the uh, fat digestion and utilization? What this slide shows is uh, just looking at energy and looking at three ingredients intentionally, corn, kind of our standard, Soybean meal representing a high protein ingredient and choice white grease representing a high energy ingredient. And looking at the change in price over four different years, uh, and it's just um, Chicago Board of Trade uh, price uh, as of September 1. So we can see how the price of corn has changed, which we're familiar with soybean meal and choice white grease. And typically, this is how I think we look at changing prices of ingredients. We look at it laterally in terms of how prices change. And I've done the calculation of what is the cost of energy per unit of, of NE um, in, in dollars. And we can see that between 2009 and 2011, of course, uh, the, energetic, the cost of energy from corn more than doubled. Um, in that same period of time, the uh, price of energy from soybean meal dropped from 24 cents to 19 cents. And you say, well, but we really don't put soybean meal in the diet for, for energy, so why do I worry about it? But the fact of the matter remains is that it takes up a fair chunk of space in the diet, 15 to 30, 35 percent, and so we do have to pay attention to the amount of energy that's supplied by that particular ingredient. Um, I mentioned that we tend to look at this laterally. I think we should to some extent look at it vertically and show how the relationships change because we can see if we set corn within each year at 100, then the cost of energy um, for soybean meal and choice white grease relative to corn change very dramatically, very dramatically. And so that uh, in 2009, the cost of energy from choice white grease was double that of corn uh, but then in, uh, in 2011, it was only about a 30% premium. Uh, if you, just to show our numbers agreed, Dean, I took the 157 and I uh, multiplied that out by, uh, by the um, energy ratio of corn to, and that worked out to just under 4.5. So it was agreed with the, the number that, that you used. So, um, uh, um, and I, I think we need to look at, you could say, well, when we least cost formulate diets that Braille or whatever program we're using takes this into account, and to a large extent it does, but are we taking this into account when we're looking at setting our limits, the restrictions that many people put in their formulations? Because these relationships, as Dean very clearly pointed out in his presentation, if we're not aware of these changing relationships, we can, uh, it can be very, very costly to the overall system. I want to turn now to the, and the response to energy, and I think everybody pretty much knows what the response to energy is, except that I want to look at it just a little bit differently. This is a trial from Kansas State University uh, done in a, on a commercial research farm looking at uh, 2, 4, and 6% added fat. 
And of course, they got the increase in uh, average daily gain, uh, got uh, a reduction in average daily fee, that's pretty typical uh, response of pigs, got the improvement in feed efficiency. I would like to uh, have you focus on the energy intake. I'm using ME in this particular instance, and it's in that range of seven and a half megacals of ME per day. So this is a study that was done in an actual research farm, and so an increase in energy from a very low energy diet to a medium high energy, but not a, very, not a real high energy diet. And uh, we can see that as there was the increase in, uh, in energy, there was some increase in average daily gain, there was a reduction in feed, there was an improvement in feed efficiency, so all pretty standard. But now look at the, look at the daily energy intake. We're now in the range of 8.2 to 8.5. Now we, because of that particular experiment, we didn't necessarily believe the results, or at least we didn't like the results that we got. We actually went out to a commercial farm, not a commercial research farm, but a commercial farm, and redid the study. Obviously, it had to be on a smaller scale in terms of diets, um, and uh, so we took the lowest and, and the highest diet and intermediate, and we're shocked that we really didn't get much on a commercial farm of getting an improvement in gain. Uh, we got the uh, reduction in feed intake, we got the improvement in feed efficiency, but here on a commercial farm, daily energy intake that's in the realm of eight, seven to nine megacals per day. The point that, what I want to point out is how very important it is on an individual farm and system basis to know what our daily energy intake is because we can't possibly understand the relationship or response to energy if we don't know what our daily energy intake is and not in just closeout basis but on a phase basis um, which actually I think most most systems can can calculate because they're filling feeders on an ongoing basis so you merely keep track of deliveries and divide by days and pigs and, and be able to calculate that so uh, in order to really understand the utilization we need to understand uh, daily energy intake. And what, are, what is it that we're seeing? What is it that's really going on here? And I call this a working hypothesis, which is an old guy's uh, uh, way of saying I really don't have a lot of proof for this, other than that looking at all of the data in, in a consolidated form. But I think what we're seeing is, is that the blue line represents that phase when we're increasing dietary energy concentration and we get an increase in daily energy intake until we reach this point when we can increase uh, energy concentration and we're not going to get any further increase in energy intake, the pigs are not going to grow any faster. We may still get an improvement in feed efficiency, but we're not going to get an improvement in growth rate. Now, fundamentally, the vast, vast majority of commercial farms are gonna be in this range here, where as you increase energy concentration, you're gonna get an increase in energy intake, and then it comes down to what is the optimal concentration that we're dealing with. But I, I think, potentially, our nutrition world is changing um, with uh, the whole antibiotic issue, um, the whole biosecurity issue, that some of the rules of engagement in how we stock our barns may be changing, and this may become more relevant in the future than it has been in the, in the past. Because we know that fundamentally it's things like crowding, it's things like health that move our commercial units over into that, into that range. So the real working hypothesis here is, is that in some such, you know, do pigs grow to eat or do they eat to grow? And I think they do both. Uh, I really do that in some situation feed intakes limits growth rate and we see that in the vast majority of farms but but even in those circumstances I believe that there are, are stressors that are limiting growth rate and that reduction in growth rate lowers appetite so the pigs eat less or at the same time that it's lowering growth rate it's concurrently impairing appetite and so and again I, you guys most of you guys know me I think we need to understand the basis for things so that we can deal with them. And so I really think that we need to be looking at situations where feed intake limits growth. And the answer to that one is relatively straightforward, and that is to feed a higher energy diet uh, or to deal with those issues that are restricting feed intake. Uh, 
But in this situation, we need to understand what these stressors are because we can throw all the energy at those pigs we want and not achieve benefit. And a, just a, a, one example of that is heat stress. We can feed a lower heat increment diet to pigs and get improved growth in heat stress pigs. But we can never, ever get pigs to grow as fast when they're heat stressed as when they're not heat stressed. And Dean Boyd has a really nice research model for heat stress because he heat stressed pigs and then he pair feeds pigs to the heat stressed pigs, so what they would eat, and that defines what is the feed intake component of heat stress, and then he looks at the heat stressed pigs and is therefore able to separate out the phenomenon that relate to restricted intake and those that are related to heat stress metabolically. And as he's looking at that, he's finding some really fascinating things. Feed intake goes down in heat stress, insulin should go down, insulin's going up. And so that's why I say I think it's valuable to us to understand uh, these phenomena. Um, looking at the energy supply to the pig, I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is just looking at gross energy, DE, ME, and NE. And one of the reasons why when we're feeding a corn soy diet, the net energy system does not have much appeal to us, and even if we're adding fat, is because of these ratios don't change very much, but when we go into co-product ingredients, then they do. Uh, Dean mentioned, um, and Jerry mentioned, the role of, of fats uh, in terms of essential fatty acids and the very, very important role that they play there. I think until David came along, the assumption was is that essential fatty acids were not limiting in our diets for pigs, uh, at least not a typical commercial diet. Uh, that now may not be true, but just fundamentally we keep in mind that linoleic acid or 18-2, which is an omega-6 fatty acid, and 18-3 linolenic acid, which is an omega-3 fatty acid, are both very much involved in, uh, in the production of uh, uh, prostaglandins, for example, other factors involved in inflammation. And because ericodonic acid is involved in the production of some of these factors and uh, eicosapentaenoic acid is involved in others, is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is so important in pig nutrition. So even though we're meeting the essential fatty acid requirements, we still need to keep in mind that ratio of the uh, omega-3 and omega-6. <clears throat> so talking in some simple terms about uh, the bioactive role of some of these uh, uh, fatty acids, Medium chain triglycerides, those that are 14 carbons or less and saturated, they are absorbed very, very quickly. They're uh, in relative abundance in sow's milk, so young piglets are able to absorb them, and they're a very effective energy source for the, uh, new, for the weanling pig and potentially could be a very effective source for the newly weaned pig. Um, and they also, uh, at least there's some data to suggest that these medium chain triglycerides also have an have a role in, uh, with antimicrobial activity. The polyunsaturated fatty acids, those that are 18, 2 and longer, um, they're involved in many, many uh, roles besides just energy. They're involved in um, uh, the lipid bilayer cell uh, structure. They're involved in intestinal structure. They're involved in, um, in for example, transepithelial resistance in animals that have been exposed to ischemic uh, stress. Um, and are involved in the rebuilding of the villi uh, when they have been uh, uh, stressed. So this, this is a diagram that I, I blame on, on Jack Odell, uh, but it really illustrates uh, some of the bioactive of, um, compounds that we feed to our animals. And the, what a, the message I'd like you to take home from this slide is that as classical nutritionists, we formulate diets for nutrients. We make sure we meet the energy requirement to achieve a certain performance. We feed certain levels of amino acids to support the energy, to allow us to achieve our growth uh, levels, our minerals and vitamins and so on. We treat them as nutrients. But we need to also keep in mind that these very same nutrients have other roles other than just producing protein, growing protein. Uh, or producing enzymes or whatever, and they have these roles that involve, for example, the, 
long chain uh, PUFAs that through the uh, cyclooxygenase pathway are involved in, uh, in inflammation and cell proliferation. Uh, the medium chain triglycerides mentioned the quick absorption and their role as an energy source, but also their antimicrobial role. And I believe as we learn more and more about feeding pigs, and particularly as we move into this era of, of reduced antibiotic usage, we're going to be understanding, we're going to be forced to understand more of these bioactive roles of what we're putting in diets rather than just classical nutrients of supporting growth. Now, all fats are not created equal. Um, as uh, Jerry mentioned, and I've got a, a few slides to support what Jerry said, but I'll go over it fairly quickly. Uh, things like chain length, unsaturation, fatty acid level, and position on the, uh, in the triglyceride inclusion level, and um, whether they're intact uh, within uh, the corn, the DDGs, or whether it's extracted oil. And I talked about that this morning, and I see some of you are here, and I promise to go into more detail of how we evaluate the true digestibility of fatty acids. Um, and chain length and degree of unsaturation have an effect on energy level, on carcass, on uh, mixing and handling properties, and so on. Uh, so here is uh, the effect of chain length on the di and the degree of saturation on digestibility, looking at tallow and, uh, and, and sunflower oil. And you can see that these um, longer chain unsatur or saturated fatty acids really are not liked by the pig very much in terms of digestibility. When we get into the polyunsaturates, then we see much better degree of, uh, of digestibility. <clears throat> uh, now I'm getting into Julian Wiseman. He's the, he's the guru, Jerry, right? And he's done the vast majority of this work. But note that his work now is 20 years old. And, uh, and I think there's a need to kind of revisit some of that information because fats have changed since then. And he really developed his knowledge. And he's got a wonderful database. Uh, by blending oils in order to achieve different degrees of saturation, different chain lengths, and, and, and uh, quantities of, of free fatty acids to come to where he, 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 he drew his conclusions and set his equations. And here you can see as you go from an uh, saturated to an unsaturated fat, we get an increase in digestibility. But note that it does tail off. This is not a straight line. Um, if uh, this is uh, from David's work uh, at, at NC State and uh, looking at free fatty acid content, and David's work certainly showed that fats with a high degree of free fatty acids are not as well digested as those uh, relatively similar fats with very little free fatty acid content. However, back uh, in 2004, Joel DeRussi, and I think this was his master's or his PhD, um, uh, I think it was his master's degree, uh, yeah. Um, when he looked at free fatty acid con uh, content, and he really saw nothing, going up to 53% uh, free fatty acid concentration, he really did not see any impact of free fatty acid concentration. So as Jerry pointed out, it looks like this is important. Uh, and this is uh, Julian Weisman work where he was quite convinced that as you increase free fatty acids, you got lower digestibility. But not all the data are aligned and agree on that particular subject. Uh, this is uh, looking at the effect of dietary fat sources on carcass iodine value, uh, going from a saturated fat to a semi-unsaturated to a very unsaturated fat, and obviously get an increase in, in uh, iodine value. Uh, one of the things that Trey did, and this was part of his master's thesis, was to look at IV and IV product uh, in terms of predicting uh, carcass fat IV. And one of the th things that he pointed out to me was that the IV product puts a lot of emphasis on the concentration of fat in the diet. It certainly does look at the degree of unsaturation of the fat, but it also puts a lot of emphasis on how much fat you're putting in the diet. So in this case, going from 3 to 6% choice white grease, the IVP went from 50 to 67, uh, but the carcass fat IV only went from, well, it didn't change at all. Okay. And, um, uh, and then looking at 6% choice white grease versus 3% corn oil, uh, it would, IV product would suggest that the iodine 
value in the carcass should actually go down uh, when, in fact, it went up. So when, uh, all we're saying here is we're not saying we shouldn't be using I IVP and we're not saying it's not a good measure, but we are saying that when we use it, let's keep in mind what its limitations are, and it does put a lot of emphasis on, on the amount of fat added, the concentration of fat in the diet relative to the composition of that fat. Trey, this was uh, uh, linoleic acid intake which he showed that as you increase the intake, got a fairly predictable and, and uh, reproducible um, increase in iodine value in the carcass. That was the average of three measures. He also compared IVB product, um, 182 intake, linoleic acid intake, or linoleic acid percent, and showed a modest improvement in predicting IV in the belly uh, with a little less error. Uh, compared to IVP. 18-2 intake wasn't really any better at all. Uh, in the jowl, although we don't care about that so much, there was an improvement uh, over IVP. And in the back fat, there was really no benefit at all. So IVP still seems to be as good as anything. 18-2% in the diet might be a little bit, uh, little bit better. Now I want to talk about the digestibility of fats and finish on this. Um, and um, one of the things that we hear, uh, yeah, one of the things that we often hear and I think have believed to be true, that the fat that's present in DDGs, for example, is less digestible than if you add corn oil, free corn oil to the diet. And, and so you wonder, well, why is that? Because this has gone through a fair a process that should actually make that fat quite digestible. Now, there certainly is the argument that if you have reduced oil, uh, DDGs, that they've taken away the, quote, the easy oil, and what's left is going to be more difficult to digest by the pig. Uh, but in this, we have to keep in mind the potentially the impact of endogenous secretions of fat, just like we take into account endogenous secretions of amino acids. That when the amino acid content in the diet is very low, the error of measuring apparent amino acid digestibility uh, at the ileum is very large, uh, and if we have high levels of amino acids, the variation is low because endogenous secretions represent a small portion of the amino acids here and a large portion of the amino acids there. So um, Jesus was doing a study, and Dean was uh, part of that project, um, looking at feeding diets with um, uh, co-products at 6% at, um, each of DDGs, corn germ meal, and wheat mids without uh, fat added, in other words, we allowed energy levels to float, or those same diets with fat added uh, in order to maintain a constant energy to look at energetic efficiency and so on. I won't get into that part of the trial, but Jesus came to me one day and he says, this gives us a perfect opportunity to try to um, determine what is the digestibility of endogenous fat, fat that's naturally occurring because we have these sources of fat here, and then on the added fat, the exogenous fat, and to compare the two. So he did that comparison, and he came up with this answer that the uh, fat that was in, included in the ingredient was much less digested in the grower pig and in the finisher pig than was the fat that was added, in this case, soybean oil. And... Um, uh, regrettably, that's what we reported at Midwest Animal Science two years ago. So you've got your 1978 paper, Dean. I got a 2014 abstract that I would like to pull because Jesus came back afterwards and he says, John, I read a paper from Denmark and it suggests that we can adjust for endogenous secretions and this is exactly what he did. So this was the when he was dealing with the diets without added fat. He was able to uh, extrapolate down to zero fat intake and calculate his endogenous secretions of fat. And in his diets that had fat added, he could do the same thing and uh, determine what the, uh, what the endogenous fat secretions were. And so when he did this, he got a very different answer to his uh, question because he showed that the digestibility of fat, whether it was endogenous in the ingredient or exogenous was added was basically the same and whether it was in the the growth the, you know the 50 kilogram pig or the 100 kilogram pig there was no difference between the two
And uh, so Nestor did a similar experiment um, where he was looking at uh, added fat from soybean oil at two and four, two and six percent with three levels of DDGs. We talked about this this morning. The apparent ileal digestibility showed that there was a definite uh, improvement in digestibility with the added fat, the, um, the uh, corn oil, soybean oil. But when he adjusted for endogenous secretions, there was no difference at all at the 2% or 6% added fat. Uh, he, did, uh, he did the same with the total tract digestibility uh, and, uh, and saw exactly the same phenomenon. So when, we, when we're determining digestibility, it's really, really important for us to keep in mind what it is we're measuring, what we think the data are telling us, and as in our case, we were fooled by our own data until we looked at another aspect of it, and thanks to Jorgensen who came up to that with that answer. So in summary then, pricing relationships for fat and energy change over time, and this is not always addressed by our least cost formulation programs and certainly can have an impact on our purchasing plans. Added dietary fat always improves feed efficiency and most of the time improves growth rate. And I hope I was able to explain why we don't always see it. Uh, the relative value of fat increases with the use of, net en of the net energy system, and Dean pointed that out as well. That fatty acids have roles as bioactive compounds, so we're not just feeding fat as an energy source, that it has bioactive roles to play as well, as well as the essential fatty acid component. That fat digestibility is dependent on various aspects of its structure, chain length, fatty acid composition, and so on. And that errors in fat digestibility can occur if we're not taking into account the endogenous losses. So with that, thank you very much.